Our next video comes from a businesswoman from California and explains how a Carly Fiorina administration would bring opportunity to all and favoritism to none. Hello, I'm Carly Fiorina. This nation was built on the promise of opportunity for all, favoritism for none. And yet we have come to a time, a pivotal time in our nation's history, where opportunity and potential is being crushed by a federal government that has become so large, so costly, so complicated, so inept, and so corrupt that literally only the big, the powerful, the wealthy, and the well-connected can deal with it. In order to restore opportunity for all, in order to level the playing field between the big, the powerful, the wealthy, and the small and the powerless, we need to simplify government, reduce its size, reduce its power, reduce its reach, hold it accountable for performance, hold it accountable to those who actually pay for it, the American taxpayer. And so we have to hack away at the regulatory thicket. We have to take a 73,000 page tax code down to about three pages. And we need to engage citizens actively in the process of their government. We need to make sure that we hold government accountable in real ways. So that, for example, when hundreds of thousands of veterans die before they receive care, there are consequences. Opportunity for all, favoritism for none can only be achieved if we go back to the basic principles of a limited government that is accountable to the citizens who pay for it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Ms. Carly Fiorina. Thank you so much. Great to be with you, thank you. Ms. Fiorina, your first question will come from Bill. Hi, Bill. Hi, Mrs. Fiorina. Uh, you've said that big business and big government get together and say, let's make things really hard for the little guy. As president, how do you wrestle that power away from the established elites in Washington and make a level playing field? Well, you know, it's called crony capitalism, ladies and gentlemen. And I don't think that it starts out with people trying to do the wrong thing. But I think what happens, what has happened, is over the last 50 years, everything just gets more and more complicated. For the last 50 years, government has gotten bigger, more expensive, under both Republicans and Democrats alike. The truth is Republicans have been talking about reducing debt and limiting the size of government and reducing its power and reach for 50 years. And it's never happened. Just like we keep talking about regulatory restraint and yet we haven't succeeded in repealing very many regulations. I can't think of any except for maybe the 55 mile per hour speed limit that Reagan got rid of finally. And meanwhile, the tax code just gets more and more complicated so that it now is 73,000 pages, as I said in that video. This means we have to challenge the status quo. But when something is that complicated, a regulatory thicket that's literally impenetrable, a 73,000 page tax code, agencies that just keep growing and growing and doing things, then guess what? Only a big company with lots of resources, accountants, lawyers, lobbyists, only the wealthy, the powerful, the well-connected can deal with that. So what is the answer? The answer is to simplify as well as to reduce power. You know why I say a three-page tax code? Because if it's three pages, anybody can understand it and anybody can fill it out. And you don't need an accountant to help you. And by the way, if we have a three-page tax code, we need a whole lot fewer people at the IRS looking over the tax code. We need to go to zero-based budgeting. You know what zero-based budgeting is? A fancy word 
Yeah, you know what it is. It's a fancy word for every single dollar has to be justified every single year. Because today, what do we do? We just talk about the rate of increase over last year. This is why, look, Heritage Action, why did Jim DeMint leave the Senate and come to run Heritage? Because he realized, as all of you do, that it's not just about replacing a D with an R in the White House. It's actually about changing the system and challenging the status quo, and that is why I'm running for President of the United States. Ms. Fiorina, many have praised your strong response about Planned Parenthood at the debate on Wednesday night, where you called for Planned Parenthood to be defunded this year. You said in 2013 that Congress never had any chance of getting President Obama to sign a government funding bill that defunded Obamacare. What has changed? How do we get President Obama to sign a funding bill that funds the government but doesn't fund Planned Parenthood? Well, you know, one of the things that's changed is we're in charge of the Senate. And we have record majorities in the House. That's a huge change from 2013. And by the way, I worked really hard for that change. And I know all of you worked really hard for that change, too. And what's disappointing is we're having the same old conversation. Nothing's changed. If this videotape, which the mainstream media continues to say doesn't exist, I mean, honestly, I went on national television the morning after the debate, and George Stephanopoulos at ABC News told me that I was mistaken, that the tapes don't exist, that the images aren't real. Well, yes, ladies and gentlemen, they are real, and I will issue my charge again. Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, anyone who, wanted to, who wants to defend Planned Parenthood, watch these tapes. So back to what's disappointing, if we will not fight for this, if we will not fight for this, faced with proof positive of the butchery that is going on at Planned Parenthood, faced with an assault on the character of our nation, and that is what I believe this is. It is not actually about whether you're pro-choice or pro-life. We cannot be a nation that funds this kind of barbarity, and that is what it is. And so, with record majorities in the House of Representatives and with a majority in the U.S. Senate, if we do not have the courage to stand up and say, President Obama, if you're prepared to shut down the government to defend this kind of barbarity, have at it and explain it to the American people. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says that we have to wait until 2017 to defund Planned Parenthood and says that an effort to defund it this year would end as the 2013 Obamacare effort ended. As President, you'll have to work with Mitch McConnell. How would you convince him to get in the fight and defund Planned Parenthood this year? Well, I think leaders should produce results. And I think there are some very clear things that leadership in the House and the Senate ought to be doing right now. I think they ought to pass a border security bill. Be nice after 25 years. Let President Obama veto that too. They ought to pass what's called the RAINS Act, which gives Congress the authority, imagine this, to actually look at regulations before they're passed. Wouldn't that be novel? And they ought 
to fight over the defunding of Planned Parenthood. Now, let us talk about January 2017. Let us talk about a President Fiorina in the White House, because what it's going to take to actually challenge the status quo, to actually change the system, is not simply the President. It's citizens of this nation. Ours was intended to be a citizen government. And so you know what I'm going to do, ladies and gentlemen, and please remember this. I am going to use the power of technology to re-engage citizens in the process of their governments. Let me just give you fair warning. Let me give you fair warning. How many of you still own a flip phone? OK, you need to upgrade. You have 18 months. You've got to upgrade. I will ask you in a weekly address, Let's say the weekly radio address. I will say to you, ladies and gentlemen, please take out your smartphones. I'd like to ask you a couple questions. Do you believe we ought to go to zero-based budgeting so we know where every dollar of your money is being spent? Press one for yes, two for no. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, this technology exists. We use it for superficial and silly things. But now we need to use it to put the pressure of a citizenry that has grown angry and frustrated and tired of business as usual on Congress so they will act. And I will tell you a quick little story so you are confident, as I am, that when, Congre when Congress feels the pressure, they will act. You remember the scandal in Arizona of wait times at the Veterans Administration. We realized that veterans were dying, waiting for care, and that bureaucrats were fudging the books so nobody found out. And the pressure for the American people was so intense that Congress passed in three short weeks a bipartisan bill that allowed the VA to fire the top 400 senior executives if they failed in their duties. The President of the United States signed it like that. Now, nothing has happened, sadly. And we ought to apply that rule all throughout government. When you do not do your job, there are consequences. But it proved this. It proved this. Pressure applied by citizens on their representatives will move the system. So ladies and gentlemen, President Fiorina will call on you as citizens of this great nation to take our government back. When she was Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton said, pressing China on human rights cannot interfere with the global economic crisis, the global climate change crisis, and the security crisis. How would you approach America's diplomatic relationships with China? How hypocritical of Hil Hillary Clinton to be running on her record of protecting women's rights when, when in her position as Secretary of State, she promptly took off the table women's rights, human rights, and any other topic of conversation that might be uncomfortable for the Chinese. Rest assured, ladies and gentlemen, I will bring that up on a general election debate stage. China is our rising adversary. China must be dealt with. China is now, as you know, becoming more and more adventurous in the South China Sea. They are building military bases on disputed islands. Perhaps you are not aware of the fact that Obama and Hillary Clinton made that situation much worse, because you see, this administration negotiated an agreement between China and the Philippines over those disputed islands. And when China immediately violated the agreement, what did this administration do? Nothing. And so China decided, OK, we're going to keep going. And through that South China Sea trade route flows $5 trillion worth of goods and services every single year. 
And so we must be assertive in the South China Sea. We must equip our allies, Japan, Australia, the Philippines, South Korea, Vietnam, all of whom are asking us for leadership and support so that they can stand with us and push back against a rising China. We must do that, I will. The Chinese cyber attack of the Office of Personnel Management is yet another example of the complete ineptitude of this federal government, grown so big and so bloated with so little consequences that people simply don't do what they know they ought to do. I served as the chairman of the advisory board of the Central Intelligence Agency for several years. We have known for a fact that China was trying to hack into our most vulnerable databases and systems, and yet the Office of Personnel Ma Management did not plug the basic security leaks that they knew were there. But, ladies and gentlemen, we have real leverage. You know why? Because China's economy has to grow to lift people out of poverty and keep peace and this regime in power. Now is the time when their economy is teetering just a little bit for a president of the United States to stand up and say, we will use our economic leverage because we have huge amounts of leverage. And one of the things we could do, and I will do, is say to the Chinese, we will retaliate for every cyber attack. We will hold you to every agreement you made in the World Trader Organization. They have stuck to none. And by the way, we're going to ask you to play by the same rules in our market that you force us to play by in their market. That is leverage, ladies and gentlemen. And it is important as China is a rising adversary, it is important to have a President of the United States who has done business in China for decades and who understands these people, their leadership, and how they think. I do. It's an honor for me to now welcome Governor Nikki Haley back to the stage. Welcome to South Carolina. It's so good to see you. See you. So I've got to tell you this great story about Carly. So um, someone came. I was speaking at the Republican National Convention. I was doing a lunch speech, and a group of women came up to me afterwards, and they said, "We have to do something." And I said, "What?" And they said, "It is so wrong." This was before the first debate. This was in Cleveland. They said, we have to do something to get Carly on that main stage. It's so wrong that the only one woman candidate is not on that stage. And I said, but you don't understand. Carly doesn't want to be put on that stage. She wants to earn being put on that stage. You earned being put on that stage. So different aspects of value strong businesswoman. In your business, um, in all that you did in business, easy decisions, tough decisions, what was the toughest decision that you had to make as a businesswoman that will make you a great president? You know, the hardest decision, I think, for any leader to make is about people, the people who work for them. It's very difficult, painful to tell people that they don't have a job anymore. And yet, sometimes that has to be done. Because, for heaven's sakes, sometimes a bureaucracy gets so bloated, we have one in Washington, D.C., that really and truly, there are too many people working there and not adding enough value. And of course, that's why it's so vital that we have a vibrant economy, so that people have other opportunities to move to. We do, however, in the federal government, have 256,000 baby boomers that are going to retire in the next four or five years. I'm not going to replace a single one. It is a window of time. But what I really mean when I say the toughest decisions are about people, the hardest decision is when you have someone who is competent, who is producing results, but who does not have the core values that matter. Those are the hard decisions. You know, tone starts at the top. In a company, 
in a family, in a nation, there are things that we call core values. And in a company, frequently, you'll go to your companies that you work in, maybe you'll see a plaque on the side of the wall, and it says some things. You know, we want to be known for high standards of excellence. We want to be known for integrity. We want to be known for a set of things, customer service. The thing is about people, no matter what you've got on the wall, they don't listen to the talk, they watch the walk. And so if you have something on the wall, but people are acting differently, people say, what's going to happen to them? And if someone doesn't have the highest standards of integrity, even though it says so on the plaque, and they keep staying there, and they keep getting rewarded and promoted, then people will conclude, we don't really believe in the highest standards of integrity. So the toughest decision I ever had to make was a young man who worked for me when I was a chief executive. He had great talent, great potential. I thought, one day, perhaps he could be my successor but he lacked integrity, and so I had to let him go. Those are tough decisions, but if you do not stand for values, if you let those slide, then everyone's going to figure out those values don't really mean anything. So now let's go mom to mom. You spoke very eloquently about the death of your daughter. We are seeing now in South Carolina and across this country um, heavy prescription drug abuse. We're continuing to see alcohol and drug abuse. You didn't have the opportunity to really get that out in the debate. And I wanted to just ask you some about that because I think so much of what we do is so that our kids have a better life. And so much of what we do is so that future generations don't have to go through the pains that we have. What can you tell us about that? So our daughter struggled with all of those things, prescription drugs, alcohol. And one of the things that I have been so touched by on the campaign trail is on the occasions when this might come up, people will come up to me always and say, and so generous of them, and say, that's happened to me too, or my family is dealing with that too. I realized as we went through the long, painful journey with Lori, I met so many other families that were going through this, but I did not realize, honestly, what an epidemic this has become. When someone is addicted, you, you watch them disappear before your eyes. You watch the, I call it the demons of addiction because that's what it feels like. They are overcome by the demons of addiction. And in our daughter's case, she simply did not have the physical strength to go on. We must invest more in the treatment of all mental illness, including addictions. We also have to realize that what we've been doing isn't working. You know, I very much agree with Senator Paul that we need criminal justice reform. If you look at our criminal justice system today, what you'll see is that we have the highest incarceration rates in the world Think about that. We have the highest incarceration rates in the world, and yet two-thirds of the people in jail are there for nonviolent, mostly drug-related offenses. We are not helping people. Honestly, the reason I'm running for president is because I do not want to see hope fading from anyone's eyes. And while there is nothing as devastating as drug addiction, it is also true that I see too many people now in this nation that lack hope in their eyes. And I also know what people look like when they realize they have God-given gifts. I remember what Lori looked like. I know what people look like when they realize they can do more than they thought possible. I know what people look like when they say, gee, I didn't think I could achieve this goal, but I've achieved it. I know what people look like when they f 
find and use a God-given gift. I know the look people get when they fulfill their potential. And for me, that look is fuel. And in this nation, every American, regardless of their circumstances, must have the opportunity to find and use their God-given gifts and fulfill their potential. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what smart and intelligent face looks like. Thank you very much, Carly. We are very, very Thank proud. you, ladies and gentlemen. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.